Welcome everyone. I'm Gillian Drake, Director of New Works in Action at Spooky Action Theatre. Now we all just watched uh, the two really uh, sly, smart, and hilarious plays. Uh, Welcome to Hell, an orientation by Bridget Grace Sheaf, and The Devil's Exclusive by Jeff Dunn. Both were directed by Sam, Sam, Samantha Wire Bellow, who is the Senior Director of Engagement and Education at the Shakespeare Theatre Company here in Washington, D.C. So, welcome playwrights and Samantha. Thank you. Great to be here. All right, Sam. So, when I look at your resume, mm. it looks like, uh, not just because we're a little older, but mm. it just looks like it's really deep with uh, this love and passion for theater for a very long time. Am I correct? Tell me a little bit about if, if it's, you know, a little bit about early. Oh, sure. I've been a make-believer all my life. I, to your first question, I was a military brat. My father was in the Marine Corps. And before I was 10 years old, we lived in six different states, both coasts. And I was an only kid. And so I learned two things. I learned imaginative play um, because uh, it was before screens were really great. I, I came up when there were the four channels that you actually had to get up and turn on the television when I was a child. I know it's crazy. And so I learned about imaginative play uh, because I had a lot of time to daydream and, um, and that was really wonderful. And I also learned how to make friends pretty quickly because we went from base to base. So those two things really got me going on stories and storytelling. And that collaboration piece of what we do pretty quickly to have to communicate to new groups, to new friend groups, to new experiences that, you know, moving to Tennessee and moving to Yuma, Arizona were two different things. So it caught me early, just storytelling and, the, and make-believing. And then um, took a lot of dance class from the time I was six years old to 21. Uh-huh. Liked that enough to tell story through dance, became a choreographer in undergrad, took my first directing class and went, oh, okay. Now there's a story that somebody else has written because I'm not good at writing stories, but I like putting them up and movement. And it kind of, it brought the two things I liked doing together. The third piece that you see on my resume is a lot of community building and teaching because I learned early on in my career from great mentors, George Keithley at Missouri Repertory Theater, Mary Garaldi at Missouri Repertory Theater. These are people when I was fresh out of college took time to listen to me and ask me probing questions about my art. When I didn't even know I had art, I just knew I wanted to be around stages and they helped me shape kind of my core values as an artist. So I try to do that as much as possible. I love to teach. Um, I love working with people coming up with people who have been around the block a long time. Mm -hmm. That's, that's why it's kind of full, kind of all those things are kind of full. Yes, it's really amazing all the different experiences and leadership in that so that was, uh, that was, uh, so I am incredibly happy that you said yes to sure. direct us to a short place at a time, which we're going to talk a little later about COVID. Well, I can ask you now in this COVID time, um, uh, my impression, certainly it's spooky action in other places that the, we start leaning on our, our education uh, a lot because they're, they can generate a little a little um, uh, money and they can keep the uh, patrons engaged. And and has that also been happening at at STC? Yes, at Shakespeare Theater Company, fortunately we have wonderful support 
And throughout this whole COVID experience, the artistic team, the education team, we've looked at how to stay connected to our audiences, knowing that theater is a three-dimensional art form that we usually do in a space and we share a space, right? To have that cathar catharsis happening. And so not, is Simon Godwin, who's our artistic director, um, has found dialogue <clears throat> and certain programming that we've been able to stay engaged with our um, community that comes to see our, our theater. Our, in our engagement and education department, we pivoted pretty quickly and our classes, our summer camp, our uh, work with the uh, District of Columbia Public Schools, we just went virtual. We just said, we just wanna stay connected to you. We want you to keep talking about theater and loving theater. And so uh, we've been very busy actually in, in my world. Yeah, and, and we've been, we've changed, we, we've, we've put everything into this new plays program and been yeah. turning out and working on uh, several plays a month for the same purpose, to be able to mm -hmm. keep it connected with our actors and all of our designers and our patrons and at least have uh, that kind of dialogue going. So that's been, uh, it's good to know. Bridget. Yeah. Uh, I love what you wrote on your website if we're talking about theater. It says, I believe theater can heal the world. I believe theater is a servant to the text and the audience. I believe theater is an operator rather than an operation. So I don't know what that means. The last one really is, <laughs> is kind of like blows my mind. So talk to me about that and your theater set. What what are those when you put those together? What does it mean? You know, I'm like I'm not saying I don't believe those things anymore. I believe them in a very different way. I was 22 when I made my website. Um, uh, you know, all of I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but um, oh, no, those are good. Uh, to say. I love this. I love them. Right, and I think I think the the thing that I have come to believe about theater, one of the things I believe many things about theater. It's all I think about all the time. <laughs> is that uh, theater? One of the questions about doing art um, that I ask myself is what do I want to do with the world and why have I chosen theater to do it? Yeah. Um, right, and uh, there's a lot of conversations that can sort of be had about um, my faith life in that and things like that. And I don't want to become like the Catholic playwright because that's I think it's more complicated than that. But um, I, as I have continued to move through the theatrical realm, what, uh, realm, what I think theater being an operator means is that I, I want to know what happens if theater is like parades or farmers markets or libraries or fall festivals or uh, you know lemonade stands like I, I want to know what it is to be so deeply rooted in the community's need to see each other and recognize themselves in each other that it is on our street corners um, that it is not in this box uh, contained by ticket sales and gatekeepers, real or imaginary. Um, that that part of my mission is is specifically about Midwest theater um, huh. and and what it means to do theater in the middle of this country and what it means. Um, Sorry, we're recording this on the day of the inauguration, so I'm trying not to cry. Um, what it means to be living in the America that we have come to know in the last, and I'm going to say eight years, because it, as much as people will think it is two different Americas, it's one. Um, and what it means to have to live side by side between the tensions and the gravity and the levity and the, the activation of something that uh, we have come to know by by looking at the things that divide us mm -hmm. and what it means that those things matter and don't matter when you go to a concert. And, you know, if one of my favorite things that I learned, I was in New York for the Lincoln Center Directors Lab in 2018. And one of my favorite things that I, and I think about it all the time is if your sink is broken, you call a plumber. If your soul is broken, you go to a movie. Um, 
And so when I think theater as an operator, like I think it is that it is active. And I think that the same thing about love. And I think we think of love as a feeling. And I don't think love or theater is a feeling. I think it is an action. That's what I'm going to say about that. That's very cool. I, uh, that's all very good. Thank you so much for expressing that. It takes all these things and puts them into into a place. And so it is an active, I agree, that idea that uh, theater and love and what you're talking about are active and they, we do. All right, so I like that. That makes sense to me. So Jeff, in your, I think it was your resume or, or your website, you said that your goal as a playwright is to address topics of substance through unique characters experiencing atypical perspectives and using subtlety and intellectualism reach audience members with the messages they are ready to encounter mm -hmm. so what does ready to encounter what does that what does that mean messages that they're ready to encounter does the theater make them ready or do they come ready because they're coming to the theater i think it's more personal that everybody is at a different stage in their own development and you know to some people there's i shouldn't say it that way to, to everybody there are lessons ideas things that they're they're on the cusp of they're they're prepared to encounter you know and somebody who is is perhaps gone through a, a tremendous amount of hardship is at a space in their own personal development, their own spiritual development, if you will, that maybe is is more complex or maybe more simple, uh, maybe more intellectual, maybe more heartfelt than somebody else who's gone through a different set of experiences. And one of the things that I think is, is nice about theater as an art form uh, is that it's, in contrast to say, um, oh, I won't even make a contrast. I don't want to put it in the context of any other art form. The thing about, about theater is that it is a blend of a lot of people coming together for that experience. There is a playwright. They put together a script. If they are a responsible playwright, they then shut up and let a director take over and do the things that the director is going to do. Um, and then you know that in itself produces a thing that gets shared with an audience. But now there's the audience and the audience has that impact as well. They, the nature of that audience, all audiences are a little different. If you've been an actor and on stage, you know that how that audience reacts to you while you're going through their show changes the show. It changes the experience of that moment. So it's as, it's as encompassing as you can possibly get. And each person will walk away with that, having taken something a little bit different. Uh, some people are looking for something that's much more superficial, honestly, that they, they come in, they want to see somebody, you know, getting hit on the head, and this is humor, and that's it. You know, another person comes in, and says, that's not funny to me. Um, it's different across cultures, it's different across generations. In fact, I had a, a wonderful conversation last night, talking about a script that we had uh, older people who were listening to it, younger people, and because of the backgrounds that they came with culture or uh, generationally they each took something very different oh that character was really sweet they were fun no no they weren't sweet they were creepy i right why well because there's an interaction with the audience um and so what you can take out of a play depends very much on what you're looking for what you're ready to take out of it uh and i i do my best when i write to have something in there for everybody uh, as much as as much as one can, and, and so that's one of the one of the pieces that I try to always fold into that and to do. And as you mentioned about the atypical perspectives on this, that's a very important theme to me personally. I try to do it in a way that gets somebody to take something that they think they know, and then to think about it again a little bit differently, because I think as as a species we tend to lock ourselves in very tightly into what we believe and as Bridget mentioned about uh, sort of the auspicious nature of the day that we're having this interview, right? we get locked into these thoughts. We say, oh, well, I know the answer. I, I know what that is. And even, you know, the opportunity, theater especially, has that opportunity to, to give people a little bit of a nudge and say, 
maybe there's more to this than you thought before. Um, maybe it's not as straightforward as, as you were thinking and that somebody else is seeing it a different way, which is, is you know, never more in history than today, very, very clear that that is in fact the case. And so to me, that, that's, a, that's a really important piece of, of what I try to do in theater. Good, that's seeing things from pers different perspectives. There's a whole acting theory on perspectives. Um, Sam, can I ask you, Samantha, can I ask you about, and we're gonna talk about these plays themselves. You had two wildly different kinds of plays, but essentially about the same thing. So do you think um, they, do you, well, first of all, did you think they were about the same thing? And then tell me how you approached each of these plays, which were written for in-person stage, trying to make them come alive through Zoom and film. Right, so first of all, uh, I want to say to Jeff and to Bridget, thank you for letting me play with your play because I read a lot, um, thank you Gillian, that was able to read many plays that Spooky Action was considering. And these, both of your plays got me like, oof, like I, I had a moment of, oh, wow, in such a short amount of time, I think the thing that they have similar is both plays in a very short amount of time uh, introduce characters that are compelling and interesting. And then the point just for me knocked the wind out of me a bit for both of them in different ways. What I loved is one was um, much darker, uh, devil exclusive, and the other was, oh, no exit. Oh my gosh, they're here in a conference room, no exit. So, so they had similar, but I think they're, they have very different personalities. And it was a joy to do both at the same time. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a little bit of <laughs> this, but they were in the same atmosphere, right? They were in the same yeah. world of um, the devil and heaven and hell and everything that goes with that. And they also talked about, they're all, both of them talk about self-responsibility, self-lack uh, of denial, right? Taking your responsibility. So. They just came at it from such crazy different places. Yes. So Jeff, with your play with Devil Exclusive, the slow creep was what intrigued me, right? The, the little drop-ins, the nuances of it, it was delicate, but it just kind of crept up. And that idea that you wove in so clearly that was hurt it was so truthful about denial and that we can even know exactly how to live a life and we refuse to do it that is such a human condition that i and i'd never heard it said that way uh so that's what i thought was very engaging with that piece with two simple characters uh i thought that was remarkable Thanks. with bridget's piece <laughs> Right out of the shoot, the lesser demon had me at, you know, hello and great balls of fire. Uh, I just went, what is this world? What is happening? And from the day old donuts, I was like off to the races. Um, so for that one, there are some clear messages in it and the convention that she uses, including Princess Diana, to convey goodness and not so goodness or really badness, yeah. I thought was, was so much fun, so much fun. So um, you can respond, but actually what I, I'd like to add when you respond, um, so you you both wrote these four, um, Th three-dimensional theater and she has interpreted them for film so I want to know if that helped is did you see your play in a new way did you um I, I don't know how did it did it hit you in a new way just talk about that experience of having seen it in your head one way and then we don't we can't even see it on stage we have to see it on film and 
and the conference room and all that. So I'll let um, uh, Jeff, you can talk first about that. Sure. It is, um, it's kind of interesting. As I mentioned earlier, this was the first short play that I wrote. And honestly, early on in my playwriting career, if you will, this was far before I ever really cognitively dealt with some of these questions like, wow, I really think that this is going to be seen on stage. Uh, it, it wasn't really, it wasn't in my thinking. Um, when the when I wrote the play, it was because I had just finished, fin pardon me, finished watching a movie that had the devil in it. And I found myself thinking about, wow, this character shows up a lot right, in film all over the place. Uh, and I was thinking, wh why is this? And the idea of the quick win, which is a central piece that is in the play. Um, and what does that mean? And as I got involved in this, it was just like, all right, I got to write this. And it, <laughs> in many ways, it, it wrote itself. And I was just the stenographer just trying to keep up on the keyboard as much as I could. And I never really thought about is where am I writing this for? What's the setting of it? Um, and if, after I finished it and I, I shared it with a friend of mine, he said, you know, this would be good on YouTube. And I went, oh, <laughs> and then I forgot about it. Um, and some years later, I shared it with a friend of mine with a production company in DC. And they said, yeah, we got to film this. And so actually it, this was on, this was in film, although that particular film uh, never got completed. We filmed it and then it, it the editing never got finished. So this this was filmed prior to ever being on stage. It then was in, on stage in a couple of different uh, performances. So to me, film is actually a more natural uh, look at this because it's what I'm used to. In fact, it was the first time I saw it was being filmed. Uh, and I think it works very, very nicely there. Um, and it is a different experience than being on stage. Uh, the way that it, the way that you, connect to the characters um, and the nature of the relationships. And to be honest, it's a little hard to describe what that difference is, um, but I kind of feel right. it as I, as I look at it. Um, right. it's, uh, but it's, it's been a lot of fun, particularly because the expressions of it have been quite different um, depending on who has produced it, uh, which is always an exciting part of theater for me. So Bridget, was this always set in an office? I don't remember. It's... Is that was yeah, it's an it's set in a conference room. Oh, um okay. to like okay. feel like it's um like you're walking in, you're getting a thing, and then you're eventually gonna leave. Um uh -huh. I I gotta tell you, I don't remember writing this play. I wrote it as part of a short play challenge that I do every year in oh. August, where I write 31 plays in 31 days. Um, most of them are very bad. Um which is like kind of beautiful. It's nice to be able to write bad plays and put them out into the world and like feel okay about that. Um, uh, but what was, what was, it's always helpful to hear other people read your play. I think as a playwright um, and as a director who works with new playwrights also, and having this just slipped on me, it is important to remember that as a playwright, I am not gonna be able to walk with my play for its whole life. Um, but if the play has any legs, it should be able to walk on its own. Like I, that's, you know, what, something about parenting, but um, there's, um, so it's always helpful to have someone else's ears on it, to have someone else's eyes on it, to go, well, I read this, this line this way. And then to just remember to like, shut up and, and listen to how, if you weren't in the room, this is how people are talking about your work. Mm -hmm. um, is that something you need to fix? Is that a play writing problem? Is it is it good to have things in place that you have to sort of grapple with, even though you have a very limited rehearsal period? Um, I have lots of opinions about that as a director and as a playwright, it was terrifying. So um, it was a great lesson that oh, way. You're right. I we think had, is we had so little. We just gave Sam so little time to rehearse this. It's yeah, but we got out of it. Yeah, well, it was phenomenal, and so um it was exciting to think about comedy specifically in this medium because it's not there's something about uh orientation in and this is true of a lot of my writing that is just like 
I watched a lot of sitcoms coming up in The Simpsons, and here's what happened when you put all of those things in one Midwest Catholic, and then they came out on. Um, but then, like, having this idea that these people are not, like, physically in the same space, in the Zoom space, mm-hmm. raised this really interesting question for me about the afterlife, but also, like, you know, what it is to be isolated, what it is to to silo yourself with your own choices. Um, so I think it raised a lot of really philosophically interesting questions for me. Um, that and sort of in combination with having, you know, watched The Good Place since I wrote this play. Um, and then having it in this room and looking at it at this format is like, oh, like what, what is it to walk into a room with a bunch of strangers and just be like, and this is the rest of your life. Like, except not, not life. That's the wrong word. Um, that's fine, you know. Uh, so in that way, like the Zoom format was really startling to me. And that was, I think, incredibly, it's incredibly useful as a playwright and and uh, doesn't happen very often that you get startled. Um, yeah. And I think that's really great. Yeah. Sam had, I, I, I love the editing. I just, I, I it was like a PowerPoint. Uh, looking at the visual field was like a PowerPoint itself. So I thought that was hysterically funny. So do you have comments about transposing these into virt- into virtual, but also about virtual work itself? Yes, lots of, lots of thoughts there. So there are advantages in producing plays virtually in a short amount of time. The pluses are, you can do really great visuals. If you have somebody wonderful like Gordon Nemo Smith, who (laughs) was our editor, who could figure out um, the conference room and how we would have folks there and how the minion could move. And just, there are things that can make it magical realism, right? That can just, very positive. I knew I, I'm going to flip back and forth just a little bit because that's how my mind was working. So I was working on them simultaneously with Devil Exclusive. As I thought about the play, I thought two Zoom screens. Du- I was interested in two people sharing a space doing this together, mm-hmm. even though we didn't really take advantage of it with, right, if we were doing it, and there would be getting up, there would be moving around the space, there would be encroachment of the space and pulling back. And, and because of Zoom, we kept it pretty still because of the green screen and things. But what that afforded us was no room to hide so the acting had to be key with Devil Exclusive and really connected. And so I got a husband and wife couple, Nat Cassidy and Kelly Ray O'Donnell who know each other's rhythms and we could get there pretty quickly. In fact, with that show, what I had to do in the three hours that we had to rehearse it was say at the beginning, you don't know each other. You don't, just remembering that moment before, right? And the sizing up, Mm -hmm. which I thought they did quite well. So the negatives though, of course, are those usual instincts that actors have where they really want to connect with a scene partner and they want to say hello. Now we're looking at each other in a two-dimensional form and how, how do we translate that human connection because so much can be said for instance and Bridget you know this and Gillian too you every director knows this the closer people get right the more potential energy there is between the two of them and the farther they are apart and even just that dynamic between the lesser demon and and one of the damned it could speak volumes Mm -hmm. and yet we aren't able to do that we have to do it with a look that being said, though, um, I think we squeezed so much out of both. Um, and thanks to Spooky Action for just letting us uh, 
I, I know both casts told me afterward I got emails. I, because I've been on Zoom, I tend to gesture this high now instead of lower <laughs> because, right, that's what we do. Exactly. Um, I, <laughs> but I got emails from both casts just saying, how fun was that? Just to, and to that end, I think the positive thing about doing impossible plays in a short amount of time, meaning five hours and then we're done, is there's not a lot of time for them to get in their heads about their work. Mm -hmm. They just have to go. And, uh, and so it was thoroughly enjoyable. Oh, that's really great. And you could see it. You could just see them kind of dive into it, especially with Bridget's play. They just kind of, they had an idea, you must have decided on it, and then they went with it. And it was really fun to see that kind of uh, exuberance that was really lovely. And, and, the, and the play back and forth. So I think we've, uh, we've kind of run out of time. I really, <laughs> I, I really well done all of you. I loved having a little thoughtful comedies in the middle of this pretty dreadful month. And it's been a thank you so much for spending some time with me and talking about your process and your plays and, and just really, really well done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you.